Good morning from London. This is Bloomberg Markets Today. I'm Anna Edwards alongside Guy Johnson and Chrissy Gupta. With the cash trade just less than an hour away, here's what you need to know. Israel launches a strike on Iran, according to U.S. officials. But there are conflicting reports out of Iran about the extent of any damage. Iranian media reports that the country's nuclear facilities are safe. Stocks slump as investors rush to haven assets on concerns of a widening Middle East conflict. Brent crude briefly spikes above $90 a barrel. Plus, Bitcoin drops on the heightened geopolitical risks, overshadowing the once every four year halving of the digital asset. In the meantime, let's put some numbers to that dynamic Anna was just talking about. Your stock 50 features really taking a hit this morning, down 1.5%. You're seeing the FTSE 100 right on its tail, but a lot of those haven bids you are seeing uh, show up as well. The dollar, however, seems to be the major player. Dollar Swiss is one you want to watch. Dollar yen, of course, is hitting a lot of technical levels there, and gold. Virtually pairing its losses now, but was much higher. We're going to dive into those market moves shortly. Stick with us. Markets Today starts right now. Friday the 19th of April. Good morning, everybody. U.S. officials, as we've just been hearing, saying Israel has struck targets in western Iran. Multiple reports from Iranian news agencies, though, suggesting that explosions around the city of Isfahan, uh, Iranian TV saying all military and nuclear sites are safe. Guys, it looks like what we've seen this morning is a big knee-jerk reaction by markets. That looks like it's now fading. There is a lack of clarity. It looks like Asian hours have probably taken the biggest hit in terms mm. of what we're looking at here in terms of the risk-off sentiment. Yeah, we'll get an update in just a moment from our colleague Jamana on the ground uh, in the region with an update on, on, on the exact developments. I say exact, but there is a lot of haziness, a lot of uh, a lack of clarity as to what exactly has taken place. But even that is quite instructive because if we are getting mixed messages, if, if it turns out that the Iranians are trying to downplay whatever has happened, whatever has taken place here, then that is in itself will be meaningful information for investors. It will. And remember, we've been trying to quantify what this conflict in the Middle East actually means for yep. things like oil prices, for the commodity prices. And we haven't gotten a clear read through. Yes, a knee jerk reaction, but still only barely above $90 a barrel. It hasn't been that exciting until it hits supply. And that's where the concerns seem to lie. If you do see an attack, does that actually affect mm -hmm. Iranian supply? Or is that part of the equation relatively safe? I think it's really difficult to tell at this point. Let's get some clarity on, on all of this now. Jumana Basechi joins us now, Bloomberg's Middle East anchor. She's based out in Dubai. Jumana, what do we know? What do we not know? It seems the picture is very confusing this morning. Markets are really struggling, therefore, to price in what okay. appears to have taken place overnight. But we don't know enough details to do that accurately. Yes, that's right. Good morning. Great to be on your show. Let me just walk you through what uh, happened this morning, the sequencing. So uh, as we know, for uh, almost a week now, there's been a lot of speculation as to how Israel would look to respond to Iran's unprecedented direct attack on Israel last weekend. And of course, as we know, most of those missiles and drones were intercepted. But again, there has been a lot of pressure on Netanyahu domestically uh, on a response and a potential response to Iran, despite the fact that their key allies, including the United States, have tried to exercise uh, some restraints or encourage them to exercise some restraints. Now, the early hours of the morning, we walked in, we heard of explosions in Isfahan, that is Iran's third largest city. Shortly afterwards, U.S. officials confirmed that indeed Israel Air Force, the Israeli Air Force, had indeed carried out an attack. Uh, and again, as we were talking about earlier, the details are still very hazy. But what we understand is that this was a very limited uh, and very uh, specific attack directed at the military air bases uh, located within Isfahan. And again, this is significant because these were the same air bases Iran used just last weekend to launch their own missile attack on Israel. So at this point, it appears to be that the retaliation was very limited and very uh, proportionate to what we had last weekend. Now, in terms of the Iranian response, as you say, they have been looking to downplay it per state media. Uh, we heard from local media Tazneem a short while ago saying there are no reports of an attack from abroad on Iran's central city of Isfahan or any part of the country, and that, in fact, it was Iran's own air defense systems that had been activated in response to drones that had been circulating. Uh, but crucially for markets, you were talking about this earlier, I think the main concern was that Israel were perhaps 
perhaps going to target some of the nuclear facilities. The Iranian state media were quick to report out that no nuclear facilities had been hit. They are safe. And a short while ago, we heard confirmation from the IAEA saying that that is true. No nuclear facilities mm. have been hurt uh, or, or, or seen any damage in response to these attacks. Yeah, and, and despite a lack of clarity, um, uh, uh, Jamana, that is the kind of information that would get out because, of course, it would be detected if there had been damage. So that is interesting in itself. So what is the likelihood, then, of other countries being drawn into this? If we are seeing that Iran is downplaying this to some extent, then maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that leads you to conclude that the, the, the risk is perhaps uh, lower than it otherwise would have been. And I think that is the big question for the region right now. And I would say the last week uh, has really amplified some of the concerns about this uh, conflict uh, getting blown out into a broader regional conflict. And remember, for the last couple of years, the confrontation between Israel and Iran has taken place through proxies, not directly. So we are getting into a new stage of this type of confrontation, starting with the response, Iran's response last weekend, because that was the first time in history Iran had directly attacked Israel. And now we got the retaliation. The question for everybody in this part of the world is whether Iran would look to amplify this one step further or whether given the limited response that we've seen from Israel and the fact that they only targeted military air bases at this point, whether that would deem, be deemed insufficient enough to warrant an even bigger response on their mm. part. So far, we have not had official commentary from Iranian officials. Everything that we're hearing is coming from Iranian state media. In fact, they're denying that a Security Council meeting is taking place. But within Israel, um, they are ready for, they are being told to get ready for a potential Iranian response. And actually, the U.S. Embassy within Jerusalem, uh, their officials have been told to be on high alert as well. Jamana, thank you very much. Thanks for the update. Jamana Basetchi joining us then, Bloomberg's Middle East anchor based in Dubai and giving us an update on what we know and crucially what we don't know at this early stage. Markets yep. had to react in the absence of clarity. We still don't have the full picture. Markets did see some reaction. We spiked above $90 on Brent, but we're back down. And even when we were up at 90, we were only where we were last week, really, to Critty's point earlier. You know, the, the reaction yep. in markets has not been that substantial. Thin overnight trading as well. Just got to factor that in as yeah. well. This came at a point where maybe the market didn't have the liquidity maybe to kind of deal with this properly. Um, we'll see how the rest of the day progresses. As you guys were saying, like futures at the moment still pointing fairly negatively at this stage. But we've been dealing with a down market all week. Uh, we've had negative reversals for most of this week throughout sessions. Maybe today actually is a day when we start low and maybe end a little bit higher, which has been counter trend at the moment. This may also just be, to your point, low trading volume, but also just taking your chips off the table. Saturday marks a big, big vote in the states that a lot of countries around the world are going to be watching. A $95 billion national security vote that includes Russian assets, yep. China divestiture on, on TikTok, Iranian sanctions, aid to Israel, aid to Gaza, and aid to Ukraine. Mm. This is something, just came back from Brussels, everybody in Brussels is talking about. There are a lot about. of geopolitical strands in there, aren't there? There are. And what is the ramification if this does get through to the House? What kind of response are you going to hear from the various countries yeah. that this targets around the world, creating perhaps some of that risk on Monday because morning? Because that takes in, you know, funding for Ukraine and the, the, the war in Ukraine. It yeah. takes in the Middle East. It also takes in relations with China. So, it, you know, it goes quite extensively. And we're going to be continuing our conversation around the geopolitics, how much risk you need to price in shortly. Is, is, is what we're getting here inflationary? Because th that's the other fact you've got to kind of... It reminds you, certainly, of the inflation it, risk, doesn't yeah, it? And, even and, if we don't stick there. Even if you don't... You go up to 90 and you test it and you, yeah. you don't stick there. Williams. Williams is mentioning yeah. the word hikes. Mm. Like the John very Williams. first time he said it. This yep. is massive. Uh, the market's taking it in, in stride yesterday. You didn't see as big of a jump as you have in the past in terms of the bond market, yep. in terms of the yield. I think it's fascinating, though, that's coming from the New York Fed president of all places. They have extra insight into the market mechanics, etc. Yes, and doesn't it come back to what we said yesterday... They say things like that. It depends how much tightening the market then does on their yep. behalf as to whether that ever needs to come to pass. I mean, there's a long, there's a long distance to travel this year, yep. it feels. Well, the market's taken yields lower because of the geopolitical, because of the geopolitical risk. risk yes. um, but you wonder how long that move yeah. lasts because, in theory, some of this could be inflationary. And then you plug Williams in talking about hikes as well. It's interesting that a lot of the Eurozone officials, ECB officials in Washington, have very much been downplaying the link between the two. But that link still exists, i.e. the ECB and the Fed. And yeah. if the Fed is hiking, that really would limit the ECB's ability to do pretty much anything on the downside cuts. Um, let's talk about what we're going to talk about next.
we've got a great guest lined up. In fact, a perfectly timed guest. Uh, we're going to dive into the implications of heightened geopolitical tension. Citigroup's global chief economist, Nathan Sheets, is going to be joining us, just publishing a report titled Geopolitics, Implications for the Economy and Markets. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Markets Today. We have 45 or so minutes still to go until the start of cash equities trading. We are very risk off. This following uh, overnight reports, uh, certainly getting news flow coming through from the U.S., from U.S. officials confirming that Israel has launched strikes on Iran, uh, but Iran saying there is no damage and actually even casting doubt on whether there were strikes. So uh, certainly there's a lack of clarity as to what's happened. The market has moved, though, the market jumping on those comments from uh, U.S. officials suggesting that Israel has launched, uh, launched some strikes. Uh, this is the extent of the reaction we see. We did for a brief period see oil Brent above $90 a barrel. That's retreated a little. 88.49 is where we trade. We saw money into treasuries, money into the dollar, into the franc, a little into yen, into gold, not into crypto. And as I mentioned, uh, into oil stocks then selling off. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about geopolitical risk. A very well-timed conversation. Nathan Sheets joins us. Citigroup's global chief economist who has been thinking a lot about the, uh, the intersection of uh, geopolitics and, uh, and, uh, and economics. Really nice to see you, Nathan. Thank Good. you for coming in. There's a lot we don't know about what's happened overnight, but this adding to a host of geopolitical tensions of late. Yeah. In a situation like this, for investors, with your experience, what are you watching for? We need to establish more of the facts on the ground, I'm sure. But where do, what catches your eye? The, the key question, I think, is very much what the markets are focused on. And that is, what are the implications of this for oil supply? That really seems to be front and center. And uh, the baseline, as the oil market is suggesting this morning, is that the disruptions are, are limited uh, to physical oil supply. But the problem with geopolitical challenges is you've got to think hard about what are the tail risks. Mm. You know, what, what could happen that's different than that baseline? And then you move from concerns in, uh, in the oil market to broader concerns about the economy and, frankly, the uncertainty associated with this. Might this thing escalate? If yeah. it does, what does that look like? OK, I mean, and sticking in the moment, if we are seeing the Iranians downplaying what has happened yes. overnight, if that tells us anything about their reaction function around the Straits of Hormuz, that's really what markets need to know. And, and if it does, then I would say that's extremely good news. And the reality of geopolitical challenges that we saw when we looked really carefully at the data is that markets tend to initially overreact. And I think it's precisely what we're alluding to here. That overreaction reflects that uncertainty premium when it first erupts. But typically, uh, these events end up being less disruptive than we fear they, they might be. Nathan, in about 24 hours' time, there's going to be a vote in the U.S. House. $95 billion of national security that targets Iran, Russia, China, defense spending, aid, etc. What do you make of that? How much of a difference does that aid package make? This is the first time you've seen all of these geopolitical yeah. issues wrapped into one with bipartisan support. Yeah. I think that I think that aid that that support is just absolutely critical. It's it's essential for Israel. It's it's essential as well for for Ukraine. Uh, this is the United States asserting its role as the leading geopolitical, military, economic power in the world. And on the one hand, is there a is there a cost associated with it? Absolutely. But uh, I think it's uh, a reflection of the U.S. role and our responsibility uh, in, the, in the world to try to ensure that the world is as peaceful as it possibly can be. You know, at the moment, peaceful and it doesn't sound like a very good description of where we are. But I think that that's the aspiration, and I think that's what we're hoping for with this, with this aid. At the same time this week, as these negotiations have been happening in Congress, you also have the IMF and World Bank spring meetings over in D.C. Kristalina Gorgieva, the managing director over at the IMF, saying very crucially she's expecting those rate cuts to get pushed back, but ultimately to show up for the United States. 
to what extent can the U.S. consumer story hold up the global economy? The U.S. consumer has been uh, exceptional. The resilience we've seen over the last couple of years uh, has been, uh, and I, I, I need to use superlatives, remarkable. And uh, uh, when I look at the underlying fundamentals of the U.S. household sector, I continue to be quite encouraged. U.S. household balance sheets are strong. Wage growth is solid. Now, a footnote to that is we are seeing some strains amongst the lower income households. And if there's a place where there may be some cracks emerging, it, it may be there. But all in all, my sense is the U.S. consumer is far from tapped out. But they are dealing with a lot of inflation and potentially geopolitical events are going to make that inflationary story more difficult. Good morning, Nathan. Um, sh how should we think about that intersection, about how geopolitics is going, to, is going to impact the inflationary story? And should we be expecting, is your, is your assessment, and you've done a lot of work on, the re on this in the report, that we, should, we are going to a period of heightened geopolitical tension where we're going to see more events and therefore the inflationary impact could be even greater, both in the short term and the longer term sort of supply side knock on? We do look fairly closely at this issue of whether geopolitical risks and pressures are becoming more intense uh, than they were previously. And on the one hand, uh, we see these kinds of, of near-term geopolitical pressures in Ukraine and the Middle East. But there are also big structural developments that are geopolitical in nature, like the rise of China, a new great power in the world. And when you have new great powers rise, that's often been a source of ongoing geopolitical pressures. So we certainly see that potential. Now, thus far, when we look at the data, we don't really see a lot of evidence mm. that the that the uh, level of geopolitical pressures is elevated relative to the last 100 years. Uh, and you think about the last 100 years, you had the Cold War and the World Wars, and you had the War on Terror. There's, there's been a lot of geopolitical pressure. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the current decade yeah. has been somewhat uh, elevated. Yep compared to the previous decade. Right, and your, your analysis is quite clear. It takes you back to sort of the 2000s, the war on terror, exactly. rather than and back it's elevated to anything. Then. Right, and it was elevated there, but we're not even, in, on your analysis, not back as, nope. as high as that. So, I mean, even in your recent uh, report, Nathan, you've got a guest essay from a Ambassador Dennis Ross, really interesting. Um, but even there, uh, saying, rarely has the world seemed more unstable. Why, it, why does it feel that way to people and investors? It, it certainly does. Now, I think part of that is is our memories are not infinitely long. And I think there are a lot of investors who don't, don't remember the Cold War and even the even 911 and the war on terror in that period. And we have been through a period of, 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 of where it's been more quiet. But then in addition, I think there are some major seismic shifts that are occurring. The rise of China, which I mentioned, the rise of populist voices in politics in many countries, and even, I think, a really interesting geopolitical development that could have huge implications is the rise of renewables. It's going to shift the role of commodities that we, yeah. that we see. So we haven't seen it yet, but I think maybe people are picking up that there are some pressures and developments in the global economy that could yet lead to meaningful shifts and perhaps even increases in geopolitical shocks and tensions. In, in just a moment, I want to pivot and talk a little bit about how central banks are going to be responding to this. We've got some sound from Klaus Knott and from, from John Williams. Just, just picking up very briefly on that last point you made, oil no longer the transmission mechanism of geopolitical tension yes. into the economy. What will become the transmission mechanism? You know, we, we struggled with this issue, and my sense it's likely to be something. Maybe in a world where we're trying to decarbonize, maybe it becomes copper. Yep. Uh, from time to time, in, in geopolitical standoffs, it's rare earth metals. Yep. Uh, but it could also be other things, like maybe it becomes access to data. Mm. Yep. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's an open issue. But even without oil, my instinct is that we'll find new mechanisms of geopolitical yeah. confrontation. But maybe pivoting away from that. OK, let's, let's turn our attention to what's happening with the central bank story and kind of come at this from, from a different angle, particularly the inflationary angle. Sit tight for a minute. John Williams was speaking yesterday. Klaus Knott was speaking yesterday. Very different kind of opinions being vocalised on either side of the Atlantic. Let's take a quick listen.
It's not my baseline. My expectation right now is that you know interest rates are in a good place, and eventually, at some point, would want to lower interest rates as the economy really gets to the two percent inflation that we're headed towards. If the data are telling us that we would need higher interest rates to achieve our goals, uh, then we would we would obviously want to do that. So it's not my base case. Monetary policy always takes place in a global context, but at the same time, we're not the 13th federal district. We have our own monetary policy. We have our own set of outlooks, economic outlook, inflation outlook. And as Christine already alluded to, uh, some of the fundamental drivers of inflation have developed quite differently in the US than in the euro area. Nathan, how far can the ECB and the Fed diverge? This is a question that markets are wrestling with in, in real time. And it's striking that on the way up, I think there was remarkable synchronization uh, during the hiking cycle. And uh, now we're at a place where some of the economic fundamentals are diverging. And specifically, it is distinctly our sense that U.S. inflation is looking somewhat more sticky than European inflation. And uh, moreover, the U.S. economy is looking somewhat stronger than the European oh, economy. So the macro context for some divergence with uh, the ECB and probably the Bank of England cutting well in advance of the Fed and maybe cutting several times, I think there's a strong case, and I think that's what they were alluding to. However, we've also seen that these major central banks, I would argue, like to follow the Federal Reserve that following Jay Powell and the Fed creates a context that smooths the communication of policy and helps build consensus on central bank boards. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, interlude here to see how much uh, 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 divergence we get. It's an open issue. My sense is that that bottom line, you can see maybe a couple of cuts before the Fed, but I'd say only a couple of cuts. It's going to get hard to, to really get into a cutting cycle if the Fed is, is holding. When we're talking specifically about kind of the marriage of geopolitical risk and the monetary policy, a lot of it is so much baked into this commodity story, that commodity inflation supply side shocks is what's going to be uh, the game changer. But if we're talking about wartime, hasn't historically, and you mentioned this a little bit in your report, hasn't historically wartime been a tailwind to the U.S. economy? Could we see that reinflation story again, not from the supply side, but from the demand side? You know, the reality is that uh, the spending associated with, uh, you know, military uh, 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 operations does tend to be stimulative, at least for the country that's doing the, the, the spending. Uh, it's uh, not necessary, and I think this is a key point, not necessarily stimulative for the rest of the world, even right. in that instance. And moreover, and I think this is the bigger, bigger point, is it's very costly, you know, humanitarian-wise, but in terms of wealth and, and, and uh, uh, structures, and over time it's a substantial reduction of wealth, even if it's an increase in near-term GDP. Nathan, great to see you. Thanks for stopping by. Good to see by. you. Thank you. Come back anytime. Be great to see you. Perfectly timed report on geopolitics. So uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Nathan Sheets, Citigroup's Group's Global Chief Economist. Some headlines coming out of Israel. Ben Veer um, suggesting, Veer, sorry, suggesting that the Israeli response to the Iranian attack was, quote, weak. He is, of course, the Minister of National Security in Israel. Um, we're getting other headlines coming through suggesting there were attacks in Syria as well. Bunts have just opened. Um, hey, even buying, unsurprisingly. Up next, we'll continue this conversation. We'll talk about how the EU is responding. We'll go to Brussels next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching Markets today, uh, Friday the 19th of April. There's a lot going on this morning. Generally, a very strong risk-off tone coming into markets as we digest the news from overnight. And unfortunately, that news is relatively confusing. But certainly the picture on futures at the moment, negative but not as negative as we anticipated it would be even mm. a few minutes ago. So the markets have been firming 
as it appears as if this response from Israel maybe was weaker than originally anticipated. Yeah, when we started this program, oil was a little higher, Nasdaq futures were a little lower, Nasdaq futures were down a percent, now down eight tenths of a percent. So we're pairing our negative expectations, I suppose, about the day ahead as a result of some of the, well, maybe a lack of developments on what's happening in the Middle East. There's certainly a lack of clarity and uh, we, it might take a long time and we may never get confirmation of who exactly did what, but we'll certainly be pursuing it. Interesting to think about whether corporate news cuts through all of this, we had these numbers out of L'Oreal, and there is a suggestion that that you know that stock benefited overnight, but that was before we saw the latest Middle East developments. Yeah. Uh, we're getting numbers out of Nissan just now, preliminary full year operating income lower than it previously was seen. So a sort of downgrade to expectations coming through from Nissan. Do any of these stories cut through on a day? We're very dominated by that geopolitical risk. It does feel like, and it has felt like, at least in the corporate space, a tale of two markets, quite literally. This consumer resilience story that we were just talking about with Nathan Sheep, yep. uh, that's driving the inflationary picture in the Fed narrative. But then, on the other hand, real weakness in Europe and Asia. And you see that, to your point, Anna, in the L'Oreal numbers and in Nissan as well. As well, I should say, the strength you saw in the Netflix numbers, again, highlighting the strength you saw in the States. Uh, this idea of this kind of divergence that you're seeing within growth has a very real effect as well in terms of the defense story, the geopolitical story, whether there is even appetite and affordability to defend in Europe and to really rearm ahead of uh, well, any sort of threat that they have, but also what a Trump 2.0 might look like. These are all questions that are starting to get priced into this market. How do you do it? How do you fund it? Do you have to make cuts elsewhere? Yeah. Some really tricky questions for, you, for Europe. And, and it feels like Europe is gradually waking up to the idea, and I'm stunned it's taken as long as it has, but it is now clearly on the narrative uh, that people are, uh, part of the narrative that people are talking about. There is a crisis. Yeah. And Europe needs to figure it out. And you've just laid out some of the, um, the, the issues that Europe faces right now. And they all do seem to be becoming increasingly concentrated. Are they concentrating minds enough for Europe to make a breakthrough, though? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where our thoughts go next. In the context of the wider geopolitical tensions we're seeing in the Middle East, EU leaders met in Brussels to make progress on some of the most contentious and significant challenges that they face. The immediate pro problem, of course, is much closer to home, the war in Ukraine. Longer term, being uh, left behind economically by Chinese and American industrial policy, will they, of course, also feature on the agenda. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. And, and uh, you're now in Berlin. You've been uh, in Brussels where these meetings were taking place. Place, Oliver, and of course, these conversations have been happening in the run-up to what we saw overnight in the Middle East. Geopolitical tensions once again to the fore. But I know for European leaders, it's the situation in Ukraine that perhaps rightly gets a lot of attention. Ukraine's defence situation deteriorating. What are European leaders bringing to the table? Yeah, I think the European leaders realize that they have sort of limited influence potentially on what happens in the Middle East compared to the situation in Ukraine, which of course has a lot more influence on them. And we know from months now we've been reporting about the ammunition shortage on artillery shells in Ukraine. That has not gone away. But now what we're seeing is Russia really stepping up the attacks on some of the infrastructure and some of the power generating units, which means they need more air defense, which we understand from Olaf Scholz. He said Germany will send them more uh, Patriot batteries, air defense ones. We understand that there will also be another six from other EU leaders. But really, I think some of the frustration was very well articulated by Donald Tusk, the prime minister of Poland. You can see it there. If all the words that were said in the last years here in Brussels about common defense could be changed into bullets and rocket launchers, Europe would have become the strongest power in the world and the safest place, right? So there's a big discrepancy between the rhetoric and what is actually getting delivered to Ukraine. And that's sort of the message that we heard from many of the defense CEOs that we've spoken to over the last couple of days, also in Brussels, saying that, listen, we need predictable large order flow if you want to get the capacity up to match the ambitions that you're talking about, right? So that's the situation in Brussels. We're also watching Capri, where the G7 foreign ministers are meeting there, also talking about stepping up um, more aid for Ukraine. But the reality of the situation for the Ukrainians and for Vladimir Putin, they're not looking looking to Brussels. They're not looking to Capri. They're looking to Washington, D.C., where Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, will, we understand, bring this Senate, uh, this vote to the House floor on the Ukraine aid, $61 billion. So while Brussels is sort of talking and maybe not making progress, the real sort of significant move forward could be this Saturday with this vote from the House that could pass the bill. And of course, it could threaten the Speaker's job. Absolutely. U.S. politics is going to dominate this agenda Let's come at this from a different angle as well, Ollie, and talk a little bit about how China is going to factor into these leaders' thinking and, and how they're going to adjust policy. Olaf Scholz has just come back uh, in terms yep. of the 
clear threat, economic threat that China poses in terms of overcapacity at the moment. Do leaders have an answer to that? Can they keep all these plates spinning? Can they find answers to all these different questions that they're being challenged with at the moment? Europe tends to move slowly, but it's facing multiple threats right now. Can it deal with all of them? Yeah, well, Guy, you sort of injected what turns out to be, I think, an appropriate degree of skepticism in terms of making some breakthroughs in some of these bigger challenges when we spoke yesterday. And that really is sort of what we saw. I mean, we got this letter from Enrico Letta, 150 pages, suggestions of how to keep Europe more competitive. And the focus for that is to expand the single market, to try to get Europe to work more like a single nation than an, uh, an arrangement of different nations. And that really sort of found some sort of immediate hurdles. There is the question of the capital markets union. Many believe that if you could really work that out, or something that we've been talking about for the last uh, 10 years, that you could really mobilize some of that private investment. Guy, you have 250 billion euros leaving the continent every year to go to other capital markets. That is what they want to capture. Where that discovers some issues is with some of the smaller nations within Europe. I mean, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, they're all in favor of having a more robust union, but the smaller nations are sort of more skeptical of relinquishing control, relinquishing power. There's also the question of harmonizing the tax codes across Europe, which reaches, of course, some limitations in Estonia and Ireland, for example. I mean, even on telecoms, we were talking about there are 32 carriers in Europe. There needs to be some consolidation in order to create efficiencies. Margarita Vestager says, we don't really think so. We don't see that as creating more efficiency. We see it jeopardizing the single market and competition. So almost immediately, despite the fact that you have these huge issues for Europe and they perhaps understand that their economic viability is at risk, the politics of it is very, very difficult until the crisis is really staring you in the face. All right, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook there walking us through some of the issues and the view from Brussels. We thank you so much for that crucial context. As we talk about geopolitics on multiple fronts, we got to factor in India as well, where six weeks of voting are getting underway in the world's biggest democracy, nearly one billion people eligible to vote as Prime Minister Narendra Modi bids for a third term in office. I want to get more on the story. Bloomberg's Menika Doshi in Chennai, the southeastern part of India, where, of course, voting is beginning. Menika, walk us through the strategy that the Prime Minister is using. Hi, good afternoon to you from Chennai in Tamil Nadu, one of South India's largest and most successful states. Now, as you pointed out, this is not just the world's largest democratic electoral exercise, but that it's taking place in the fifth largest economy with the fastest growth rate means the implications matter to the global economy as well. Now, in this election, Prime Minister Modi's policies that range from majoritarianism to a big infrastructure push in recent years will be tested. But Modi is look, not just looking to come back for a third term. He's looking to come back for a third term with a super majority of more than 400 seats in the total tally of 543. And so the world watches, investors are watching, uh, Menika. What, about the, uh, what are the main issues then for voters? India is, like I said, the fastest growing economy in the world. The last numbers came in at above 8% for this full fiscal year. We will clock somewhere close to 7.5% or more. Now, that growth is also characterized by the lowest consumption growth in two decades. It's characterized by chronic joblessness amongst youth. This is a country which has a very high youth population. These are the economic challenges that an incoming government would have to deal with. Uh, boosting manufacturing, uh, being able to push services exports further, global capability centers, which have been a big contributor to growth in recent years. So all of this matters to global companies that are looking at India as an option as they shift away from the China-led supply chain strategy. Can India's policies make their move to the country more attractive? Menika, in terms of how a third term from Modi would evolve were he to win this election, what do we know about kind of how the rest of the world is going to react to this election, how carefully people are watching this election. What's he already indicated in terms of he, how he will deal, not with India, but with, with the rest of the world? What is it going to say, if he wins, about India's place in the world? It's an interesting question. I don't know if you recall, uh, you know, the many images that emanated from India when we were hosting the G20 last year. 
but one of them has stayed with me and I'm sure many others uh, all through these past few months and that is of Modi uh, leading several leaders from across the world including President Biden uh, and Prime Minister Sunak uh, to the uh, to Mahatma Gandhi's uh, you know sort of uh, uh, fire now that image of Modi walking ahead of all of them is exactly what this government wants to project, that India is finding its place in the world. And the world is watching very, very closely, not just for trade reasons, but for geopolitical reasons as well. For instance, the news that has dominated, uh, you know, through the morning, India is amongst the few countries that have ties to both Israel and Iran. And the government here has been calling for a de-escalation over the last several days. So I think the world is watching this election very closely to see who wins to see what that means for what India's place in the world will be and where it will align. So far, India has walked a middle path. Uh, you know, it hasn't strongly aligned with the U.S. while touting a very strong friendship, but also purchasing large amounts of oil from Russia post the Ukraine war. So will that policy continue? Will it change? These are the questions the world will be posing of a new government, whether it's Modi or someone else. Yeah. Menika, thank you very much indeed. Menika Doshi joining us from Chennai uh, as we start this process of the Indian election. Let's turn back to what we're watching so carefully this morning, and that is the implication. I was going to use the word fallout, but uh, it seems as if the nuclear strikes, uh, the, the nuclear sites are safe, uh, so that wouldn't be appropriate language. But the implications for the global economy of what we've seen overnight, oil gaining, haven assets certainly have been moving, but it does seem as if we're fading some of those moves. Uh, we're going to track you into the open. That's in 17 minutes' time here in Europe. We were initially looking at a very, very soft open this morning. Things have firmed a little bit, but it looks like we are still going to be lower. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Markets Today. We have 15 minutes to go until the start of cash equities trading. The futures picture suggests we will take a leg lower at the start of trade. The Asia session has been weak. This all as a result of factoring in further geopolitical risk. Reports are pretty unclear, but it seems as if there has been some kind of attack on Iran, perhaps also on Syria. We see reports of both confirmation, actually, from U.S. officials that Israel attacked Iran. Some uh, hawks in the Israeli government des describing that response as weak. Uh, this developing story clearly weighing on sentiment and causing a move into various havens this morning. Let's weigh up where we are. Let's take two minutes on the markets with Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets, Paul Dobson, who joins us this morning. Paul, uh, very good to have you with us. So markets reacted, didn't have the full picture. We still don't have the full picture about exactly what has happened in Iran, in Syria and by whom. Uh, but the markets are nervous. But we're off, off for earlier lows on stocks, off earlier highs on oil, as if perhaps... You know, we're working our way through this. What's your sense at this point on this story? Yeah, Anna, I think you're right, Anna. Um, maybe uh, the knee-jerk reaction that we had in the Asia session when we didn't have all, all of the details was a little more extreme uh, than what we've got now, where it seems like there's no immediate um, saber-rattling or escalation on the Iranian side, not huge outrage, and on the flip side, not too much damage caused by whatever these blasts and explosions uh, have been. And so that's enabled the market to unravel some of the extreme uh, risk of sentiment that had been priced in while uh, still being on edge and setting us up for a risk off day. I think, you know, the big concern was, is this a strike on uh, military um, uh, uh, um, structures in Iran? Is it, is it on the uh, nuclear stuff? It became clear that the, the damage didn't seem to be anything like as extreme as that and probably not aimed in that direction either. Um, so as you said, uh, mm. some, some officials describing it as, 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 as mild, but enabling the market to cool off a little bit from uh, some of the moves that we'd seen priced in earlier. Yeah. Where does this leave Treasuries, fixed income markets, Paul? Because there are competing trends, just as we saw at the beginning of the week. It seems the haven bid is winning out over inflation fears this morning. But where does it leave us? 
Yeah, so it's interesting the Treasury's response. Earlier on, overnight in the US session, uh, there was a little bit of focus on the fact that two of the Fed policymakers actually responded to questions on the possibility of hikes and said that they wouldn't rule it out. All of a sudden, we were thinking, oh boy, are we headed for another Treasury sell off? But of course, you know, in came uh, the, the Haven bid, which flipped us on our heads in a way, uh, drove uh, interest rates lower, shows that Treasuries still do have that Haven appeal if you're looking for places to hide out when there's risk. That and gold uh, did well. The yen and the Swiss franc rallied as well. So uh, some haven assets did perform after all. Paul, good morning. It's Guy. So we're we going to flip back fairly quickly to focusing on that Fed narrative. All right, Williams is out talking about hikes, as you've mentioned. How quickly do we return to that? We have seen a pretty risk-off week, basically. You certainly look at kind of how sessions have developed. Mm. You've seen reversals throughout most of, the day, most of the days, and we've been heading lower into the close. I, broadly, as we come to the end of the week, how weak is sentiment for risk assets? Yeah, impossible to completely say without fuller clarity on exactly what happened in the Mideast. Uh, guy, and I wouldn't want to be flippant about that by any means. When we started this week, you know, the question that we had before markets opened on Sunday was what would be the Israel response to the situation, to the Iran bombardment that we saw uh, over the weekend? Um, we got a little bit of an answer to that now, but it's not clear that that's the final answer. And so those tensions remain uh, elevated uh, even though during the week, you know, the, there was also all of this uh, look at the higher U.S. interest rates and what that's doing to currency markets and the dollar as well. Feel like uh, that's not gone away. And in fact, you know, if oil prices continue to uh, have an embedded premium in them, that only uh, talks to the idea of higher inflation still and the need for the Federal Reserve to continue to worry about uh, that inflationary outlook, uh, all the data that we've had has been pointing to the U.S. economy still firing on all cylinders as well. So that's all there in the backdrop. Uh, the IMF meetings this week provided a nice canvas for everybody to be discussing it. Now, of course, we're going into this period where we're not going to hear from Fed policymakers for a while as well. So it's only going to keep the market on edge uh, as we build up to the next meeting and the next fuller update into, into Fed thinking that we'll get from there. But it's really interesting. You look at the pricing in the market. You know, we're basically at zero for the front months in terms of whether the Fed's going to cut or do something else. Uh, we only see a full... Yep. Uh, cut being priced in September or maybe November and only, you know, less than two for the entirety of this year. So that talks to that idea that we're going to have uh, that embedded premium in uh, yields and that's going to continue to support the dollar and drive that kind of uh, nervous um, sentiment across the rest of the, the global uh, financial market complex. Paul, thanks for the update. Always appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets, Paul Dobson. Very much kind of top-down macro feel to the start of the day, but actually there's some single stock stories that we need to plug in as well to the narrative. Let's do that now with Joe Easton. Morning, guys. So we have got some strong sales numbers out of L'Oreal in France. The French skincare and makeup firm reporting a jump in their like-for-like -like sales, and they did beat analysts' expectations at 9% versus expected less than 7%. Double-digit growth across all regions except North Asia because China tourism still seems to be a drag on some of their sales. Chinese tourists not travelling as much as they were pre-pandemic, still weighing on some of those sales. But we did see a decent jump in the American depository receipts over in the US. The ADRs up 5.6%, a nice gain for that one. The thing with this one is it has declined recently following a little warning from the big rival Ulta Beauty over in the US, the maker of the MAC brand in terms of makeup. That one did slide and weighed on L'Oreal's ex potentially expectations lowered heading into this one. Then we're also looking at Essilor Luxottica, another French-listed company, maker of sunglasses and also general eye care. Now, sales out of them, pretty strong as well, aftermarket last night. Constant FX sales on the quarter, up 5.5%. The maker of Ray-Ban and Oakley, however, sees the strongest growth over in Latin America, up as much as, sales, uh, up as, much as 11% in terms of sales. But the interesting thing here is they say North America is saying weakness in some sunglasses. Americans not buying enough sunglasses, according to them. Now, in terms of the analyst ratings, we've got 13 buys, only three sales. 
even as this stock trades near a record high at the moment. The prescription business does give a bit more of a defensive quality to the stock. It's a bit more stable than sunglass. We can see it up 87% on a five-year, but as I say, that stock near a record high at the moment. Then we've also got a big share sale over in the auto space. Geely from China is offloading around $1.3 billion worth of Volvo truck shares, according to a statement yesterday. They will remain the second largest holder in the company, according to the statement. There it is on the screen. So they're selling 49.5 million shares. It is priced at a 2% discount, though they say it is in line with their longer-term strategy, kind of just diversifying the portfolio, but it's priced at a discount, and that stock is expected to continue underperforming the broader auto sector this morning. All right, our equities reporter there, Joe Easton, walking us through some of the stocks to watch. We thank you so much. He'll be back later to give us an update. There's another one that we are also keeping an eye on. That, of course, is Schneider Electric. This is one of your favorite, one it of your is. sensational yep. six. Confirming talks with Bentley Systems on a potential deal. They're still saying they're early talks. Remember, the Wall Street Journal had reported this yesterday, saying there may potentially be a merging of its software business with Bentley Systems. But again, early stages. They are now coming out and saying that is a confirmed report. A lot of money in engineering, in transition, in all of that uh, grid technology. Well, this is an AI play. This is what yeah. people are using Schneider for, basically, at the moment. It's, it's how do you power up these uh, big software sensors that AI is going to require. Uh, and it's got a lot of the technology. So that's why it's had the pops that it's had. It's interesting you kind of plug that into next to, to I use the term advisedly, uh, AVB as West, yesterday, that was also kind of moving strongly on this story as well. But it's interesting they're expanding now, looking to get a greater footprint in the States on the software side. Yeah, we'll see how much these individual stocks come yeah. through, won't we? Because expectations are that we open a little bit weaker. The geopolitics very much to the fore. With that in mind, we're keeping an eye on what's happening on the island of Capri. G7 leaders are gathering there. We've uh, been monitoring the images coming through as they uh, assemble ahead of the G7 meetings. The UK Foreign Minister David Cameron is there. We've seen the Japanese, uh, the German Foreign Ministers as well in this shot. We'll continue to bring you lines from this as well. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Markets Today. A few minutes to go until the start of cash equity trading. Now, look, we did start to see earlier on futures really taking a little bit of a downturn, this kind of risk-off move that you saw across uh, the market. All that's getting paired back, though. So does that then put the onus on kind of the individual market moves? We've seen plenty of micro. Joe Easton was just walking us through some of the stocks to watch there as well. Or do you simply see more of the macro, taking your chips off the table ahead of what's likely to be a little bit of a volatile weekend. Yeah, and we saw this ahead of last weekend, didn't we? There was yep. nervousness, but then, you know, we saw that big reaction from Iran last weekend, and now we've seen, perhaps, if these confirmations from U.S. officials are right, we've seen some kind of action from Israel. Does that give markets a chance to draw a line on, in the sand? I mean, right now, yeah. in the moment, we're going to see something very risk-off. What speaks the market more today? Williams? or what's happening yeah. in Iran. And therefore, where do bond markets end up? Precisely. So bond markets have caught a big kind of big, we've seen yields moving lower. Yeah. That's on the de sort of the, the, um, the escalation that we've seen over, overnight. You've now got to price in Williams. Like, he's talking about hikes here. This is, this is New York Fed talking about hikes, yeah. which is... Not his base case, but not you could see... No, no, but the language... Yeah. So you, you never go straight to the... You never kind of shift. You start to kind of introduce concepts. And, and yeah. he's clearly kind of flying a kite here in terms of seeing what the reaction is. But he's talking about it. Yeah. I still think it's interesting that's coming from him, though, because the New York Fed is the one that kind of uses it's, it's when the Federal Reserve needs to do QE or QT or intervene in the markets. Yep. It's done through the New York Fed. So he has access to this real time data. And I feel like him bringing up the fact that a hike may be on the car says the markets can handle it. The data he's seeing can handle it. Because there isn't caution coming yeah. with that. He's just saying it's a possibility. OK, so we are waiting for these European equity markets then to open up in around five seconds' time. We are expecting geopolitics to the fore. A, a bit of a sell-off in stocks is the expectation. The Asia session down by 1.8% today. In particular, Japanese markets were under pressure through the Asian session. So we have some, a bit of weakness then at the start of trade. We'll see how long it lasts, I suppose. But U.S. futures are also negative. E-mini's down half a percent. Nasdaq futures down seven-tenths of a percent. As we watch the FTSE drop three-tenths, um, um, the DAX dropped by two tenths. So modest risk off as we wait to, to get further lines out of either Israel or Iran here. And everything we've heard so far this morning out of Iran from various sources uh, seems to be quite uh, of a de-escalatory nature. Clearly, we've already, we've, you've already seen our response. 
seems to be the line that That's appears, one to, be, of the lines appears morning, to be coming yeah. through uh, over the last few minutes, which is really interesting that, that Iran is making this point. There's been a lot of flagging of some of the moves that have been made here. Iran heavily flagged, heavily trailed the fact that it was going to be making uh, a move. The Israelis appear to have done something similar, or at least those around them appear to have done something similar as well. So therefore we get back to kind of what is going to move markets today. Yeah. Is it going to be what's happening with the Fed? Is it going to be what's happening with, with the stock market story? How do we price in Netflix this morning? In terms of the single stocks we're watching, Schneider's week this morning, ASML continues its move lower. So chip stocks are down. So this kind of idea that maybe the chip sector was going to rescue markets. It's been a very negative risk-off kind of week this week for stocks globally. Chips have been at the centre of this story. ASML's been at the centre of this story. And more... ASML is down by a percent this morning. Schneider's down by... 3%, and some big banks are giving some softness as well uh, to this market too. So UBS is down, HSBC is down. Yeah, thank goodness for L'Oreal then. That <laughs> takes us in a different direction. We have consumer products and services gaining this morning. L'Oreal is part of that story up by 4.7% uh, this morning on the back of those numbers that pushed their, yeah. their listing in the US higher as well. The consumer uh, sector has been kind of on a tear this week, and you brought this up as well, that perhaps there's some sort of inflationary hedge play showing up yep. in the market. You said that earlier this week with Unilever. To me, it's the commodity story that's catching my eye. When you look at what's actually weighing on the market from an index perspective, especially on the FTSE. You're seeing Shell lower, you're seeing Rio Tinto lower. If you see commodities broadly higher this morning on a macro basis, why is it not showing up in the stock market? I think that's it's, where you're starting to see that risk-off move show up and dominate what you're seeing in the commodity I, I think from a, from a miner's point of view, you can understand it. From an oil point of view, I think it's... It's interesting that the, the stocks are not reacting in the way that mm. oil has been reacting. And in theory, it should, right? If the concern here is that perhaps Iranian supply or kind of stricter uh, enforcement of, of the sanctions that have already been placed may be at play here from the states, then there's that immediately should mean some sort of kind of line in the sand or some sort of a floor under oil prices, which we are seeing, by the way, 88 handle on Brent, not showing up in Shell, not showing up uh, in BP and the like. Yeah, that is interesting. BP fairly flat, Shell a little bit weaker uh, this morning. Uh, in terms of other sectors then on the move, there aren't many in positive territory, but there are a few. Another day where utilities to the fore, so utility stocks up by two-tenths of one percent. The worst performing sector today, though, is autos and auto parts. Uh, interesting, we got that line out of um, uh, Nissan earlier on today, yep. a bit of a downgrade to their expectations about what they're going to do in the full year. Uh, and, uh, and we do see some weakness across the European auto space this I think morning. we also just need to widen the lens here a little bit and just think about the week that we've had. We've had a series of negative reversals during a number of days this week where the market <laughs> opens and then f kind of moves a little bit higher and then fades. Maybe today doesn't look like that. But the market is kind of... The stock 600 is now trading below 500. We're trading 496. It's quite a decent move to the downside. Remember, the high was hit uh, on the 28th of last month, 512. We're now trading 496. So this week, the last kind of week and a bit have seen some quite big reversals. And this week has seen some really quite big moves lower for European equities. And there are still calls out there that we're going to hit 540. Remember City Goldman upgrading yep. on the, And they haven't changed their calls yet. So it feels like, at least, and remember we haven't heard from these players just yet, but it feels like the thought, at least on, on Wall Street and, and global Wall Street, is simply that this is a temporary dip. Yep. Do we continue, though? I, it's going to be interesting to see how the CTAs, some of the trend followers, yeah. if... If, if the momentum turns, do they turn and how significant... You know I love an algo conversation, Guy. <laughs> it's, it's Friday. Mm. Uh, let us uh, let us uh, just take stock of where we are then. European stocks are down. Stock 600 down by 7 cents of 1%. And the reason for this is geopolitical. Uh, geopolitical risk off as a result of developments overnight in the Middle East. So let's get the latest here. US officials say Israel has launched a strike on Iran less than a week after Tehran's rocket and drone attacks. Brent crude spiking on the news, jumping above $90 a barrel very briefly before pairing those gains. Let's get more with Jamana uh, Basetcher who joins us. Bloomberg's Middle East anchor based in Dubai. Jamana, bring us up to speed with the latest because a few hours ago this all looked extremely risk-off. Now it looks a little less so, especially when you take into account some of the recent lines coming through from Iran. Yes, that's right. I mean, if you can think about it, uh, over the course of this week, there's been a lot of speculation as to how Israel would look to re retaliate to that uh, unprecedented Iranian attack on Israel last weekend. And indeed, it looks like that retaliation has actually occurred overnight. The explosions happened in uh, Isfahan, and it later emerged, and details are still fuzzy at this point, uh, that the target of this airstrike were specifically military bases and air bases, which Isfahan is home to. And of course, were the 
launch pad of Iran's own missile attacks on Israel last week. So it looks as though the response so far has been limited and proportionate. Now, again, I do want to mention at this point that Israeli officials have so far not taken responsibility for this attack. But we did get a tweet just a short while ago from the uh, National Security Minister, Ben Gavir. It's just a single word, the word weak. And again, what he's alluding to here is the split within the Netanyahu government at this point. And it seems like many members within the government would have liked to have seen a more hawkish response. And what that does tell you is, in this case, even though Israel have chosen to retaliate, perhaps they've done enough to show that they are retaliating to what Iran did last week, but are not looking to escalate beyond what we've seen. The ball, of course, is in the Iranian courts at this point. Uh, so far, again, no official commentary from Iranian officials, but we are getting lots of lines from Iranian state media looking to downplay what happened. Just to give you an idea, early on in the morning, they were saying that there are no reports of an attack from abroad on Iran's central city of Isfahan or any part of the country. Uh, Iran Iran's own air defense units were activated. State media is saying that three drones were actually shot down. One last thing that I do want to say is that it's important to put into the, what has happened in the last 24 hours in the context of Iran's uh, foreign minister remarks yesterday at the Security Council, where he said that the Iran attack on Israel last week was legitimate defense, but he warned Israel about further adventurism. The question, guys, is whether what happened this morning would be deemed uh, uh, sufficient for the Iranians to go back with another retaliatory strike. And that is the big question for markets at this point. But I think what provided some relief uh, to investors was the fact that those nuclear facilities were not targeted a fact that was confirmed by the IAEA earlier this morning as well. Jumana, thank you very much indeed. Jumana Vazetchi joining us out of Dubai. G7 foreign ministers have just sat down for their conversation. The cameraman's just walked out of the room. We'll see what commentary uh, we get from that meeting. Let's talk about how markets are reacting to all of this news, the confusion that we are seeing. I want to start with Joe here and figure out exactly what is happening. Joe, what are the defence stocks doing this morning? Good place to stop because we are actually seeing some minor outperformance in these stocks. Bear in mind the broader market is down pretty significantly. So we are seeing these stocks outperforming. Only small moves, actually most of them in the red at the moment. Bear in mind they have had this huge rally recently trading at 20 times earnings. There are concerns around valuation levels at this point. And on that note, we have actually got news of Deutsche Bank downgrading Ryan Mattel, the big German supplier. I imagine this note was written before last night's news, but nonetheless showing you how investors are thinking about that. They note Ryan Mattel has risen by three times since they upgraded to buy in November. Just an idea of how much these stocks have rallied. But the one in focus for sure today. There are actually bigger moves, though, in airlines, interestingly. We had that spike in the Brent crude price, about 4%. A lot of that has retraced, of course, overnight, but oil still higher, and that weighing on airlines this morning, seeing IAG, Air France, Ryanair, Lufthansa all lower. The other thing, not just the oil price, is about how it disrupts travel around the Middle East regions as well in terms of the geopolitical situation, but that is clearly weighing on the sector alongside the oil price today. Then we'll look at some earnings. We did do a few of them in the stocks to watch, one of which L'Oreal. There we go, a decent gain for that one over in France. Their skincare and makeup sales are beating expectations everywhere apart from China. That continues to be a weight. And we mentioned Essilor Luxottica talking about sunglasses not selling as well in North America. Quite an interesting line from them. We're seeing that stock coming down further from a recent record high up 2%, uh, excuse me, down 2% at the moment over in France. Final French one, Sodexo. This is the airport catering company. Strong sales out of them today. That one gaining 4%, but a massive move is Royal Unibrew over in Denmark, Copenhagen. They have the rights to sell Heineken over in Denmark. Heineken obviously is listed in Amsterdam, but they have the licenses for that. A 14% gain on a Friday. Everyone starting to think about the pub, maybe that one up 15% at the moment today. A couple of deals to bring you as well. We mentioned Geely offloading all that stock in Volvo trucks. So that one is lower as expected. 
down 4% today. It's more than a billion dollars worth of shares. And Schneider Electric potentially doing that massive deal for a US-based rival. It's got a market cap of $17 billion. That is breaking news. It was reported out of Reuters. Potentially Schneider looking to do some big M&A. And that stock is coming down 2% over in France this morning. A couple of morning calls. They're both in banking. Barclays is getting a new buy rating over at Peel Hunt, who says the valuation is too low and the buyback outlook is exciting for them. That one gets a buy again down with the broader market, potentially a slight outperformance against some peers. 245 is what it's worth, according to Pill. Trades at 182. And finally, Santander downgrades their Spanish rival BBVA. They are saying that the BBVA bank is seeing a decline in lending earnings over in Spain. They're cutting it to neutral. It's down 2% for BBVA over in Madrid. All right, Joe Easton from our equities team, we thank you so much for walking us through some of those crucial morning moves uh, this morning, for lack of a better term. Let's go from the micro to the macro. Joining us this morning, Skylar Montgomery Coning, Director of Macro Strategy over at TS Lumbar, joins us right here on set. A pleasure to have you on the program. Look, the highlight of this morning seems to be the geopolitical risk. And although it is getting pared back, you are seeing that stock market kind of being weighed down by the risk, even though you're seeing some of the other pieces of this market, FX, currencies, et cetera, pair some of the move. Is this simply a cash risk off kind of play and how long do you think it'll sustain? I think, you know, what we were seeing this year was a very strong equity rally and that was losing some momentum. And so because we've had this bit of a wobble from the risk side, it's taken it to kind of get that exhaustion momentum for the risk itself. I think the issue is with geopolitical risk and especially this in particular, it's very hard to price. So what you tend to see from the market is they just ignore it after a while. And if it doesn't keep coming up, if you can't keep getting risk events on it, then it moves on because the worst scenario of oil prices well above 100, that's very hard to find a middle ground of where you price it or kind of what percent you price it. So it just moves on largely. What is then the focus for Europe in particular in terms of the kind of bull case for Europe, whether it's equities or whether it's kind of the bonds as well? Is it the rate cuts that may front run the Federal Reserve or is it the catch up trade coming out of the states. What has a bigger effect on European assets? I think it's both things, right? We're getting more optimistic on global growth. We're definitely seeing a bottoming in Chinese data. And that's meant that there's been a broadening of the rally. And you've actually seen U.S. equities underperform or perform more in line with other markets. And equities in particular, what you've seen is that there's been that broadening in Europe. And European tech has done quite well as well. The other thing is the cuts. It's certainly that we've had stagnation this year. The ECB is tight. And so you need cuts this year to see a rebound and growth in Europe yeah. for 2025. Let's talk about the scale of the cuts. Multi-central bank governors on the tape right now talking about 50 basis point cuts. How realistic is that? And I want to play some sound as well. This is Klaus Knott in D.C. talking about the ECB's relationship with the Fed. Monetary policy always takes place in a global context. But at the same time, we're not the 13th federal district. We have our own monetary policy. We have our own set of outlooks, economic outlook, inflation outlook. And as Christine already alluded to, uh, some of the fundamental drivers of inflation have developed quite differently in the US than in the euro area. John Williams in the States, though, talking about the potential for hikes, maybe coming through from the Fed, not the base case, but he's talking about it again. Skylar, how far can that divergence go? How possible is it that we could see a 50 basis point cut from the ECB? The, the, the consensus is that the ECB cannot stray too far from the Fed. How far is too far? I think it's warranted that we're seeing that divergence. And I'm surprised that we haven't had it priced more early in terms of we've seen economic divergence and it's not been reflected in the policy. And I think, yes, we've had a little bit of spread widening. We've had a little bit of that pricing in the 2024 stir markets, but it's not enough in terms of if you look at What's the whole enough? hiking. What's enough? <laughs> Talk me through what, yes. if, if you were in charge of this, what, what would that spread look like? How big a divergence could we be heading, do you think we should be heading for? I think we need to be focusing on where the landing zone is. And so for the ECB, I think you can get at least 200 basis points over the next two years. And that's certainly not price. It's just chasing Fed pricing. Fed pricing is at around 120 to 150 for the whole cycle. And that looks more reasonable. But I think you need at least kind of 50 basis points more in Europe, in the ECB, cut pricing over the next two years. And, and is that, we've been talking this morning about the interplay of geopolitics then and the 
the stories around uh, inflation and inflation expectations and what that means for rates. The rates picture looks confusing, but then the, across the Atlantic, pulling in two different directions, mm -hmm. perhaps. But then you put that alongside geopolitics, which also pulls treasuries in a different direction, because you see this morning that it's, you know, it's not the Williams lines about the possibility of Fed hikes. It's the geopolitical risk that sends people into treasuries. How do you, how do you uh, approach the fixed income markets right now, Skylar, when you've got those pools in opposite directions? Yes, it's quite hard. I think, you know, what we're seeing in terms of policy pricing, in terms of the neutral rate that the market's looking at, around 3.9 percent, the 10-year looks fairly priced. What you are worried about is the term premium, which is what you're talking about with the geopolitical situation. Term premium is very close to zero, and historically that's really, really compressed. It should be closer to 150 basis points. So if you have more economic uncertainty, if you have more geopolitical uncertainty, even even if you just have the kind of increased supply that we've had more recently that's expected to continue, you'd expect higher yields on that term premium component. Mm. And, and then that maybe pushes, well, all of this, if we are see it, well, if we, if we see the inflation story back to the fore, that's been pushing the dollar higher. The haven uh, flow pushes the dollar higher as well. It, it, does that become a problem that breaks somewhere, Skylar? And maybe doesn't break in the United States, but breaks for somebody, because we've been talking a lot on this program about how the strength in the dollar, yes, it's grown in the U.S., but it's problematic for the globe. I mean, absolutely. There's this problem when you get a stronger dollar. It's not very good for risk sentiment. There's also a worry about inflationary pressures. I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of people are talking about euro dollar depreciation and that inflationary impact bleeding into what the ECB decisions are. We aren't there yet in terms of we haven't had a big enough move, but certainly at some point it's a consideration. But if we're talking about hikes, at least as maybe not the base case, but it's entering the conversation, should we be talking about parity as well? I mean, certainly if, if we're talking about hikes, we definitely should be talking about parity. I think just on the divergence that I expect, which is, you know, not as much as you'd get from a hike, you'd expect much more euro dollar downside. I think, to, you know, Anna's point earlier as well, if you think about what are the hedges right now to the risk that we have, the risk being higher interest rates and geopolitical tensions, the answer to both of those things is long dollar. In terms of the transmission, I, I want to get your take on, uh, on a question that, that we were talking about with Nation Sheets a little bit earlier on. Are the transmission mechanisms into the global economy going to change significantly from geopolitics? At the moment, it's oil. We, we get up in the morning, we, see a, we saw a story like this, we look at the oil price. Are we, looking, are we looking the wrong way? Are we thinking about this the wrong way? Increasingly, is it going to be copper and, and how... how these stories kind of relate back into the global economy. I'm trying to understand that because if you're going to build hedges, you want to be thinking about that. So maybe in the morning I don't kind of look at what's happening with, with oil. I look, at, I look at the copper price. I look at the miners rather than the oil producers. Is that going to change over the next few years? And is the way we need to think about geopolitical reaction in the global economy going to change significantly? I mean, I think certainly it means we're thinking about higher volatility, we're thinking about higher inflation. I think the other bit that's changed is the central bank reaction function, right? So historically, because of the equity bond correlation, you could find some reassurance in, in being in a 60-40, right? Your bonds wouldn't sell off in that kind of geopolitical yeah. situation. But if you have higher inflation and the central bank has to respond to that, then you also get fixed income selling off. And so people have to think about alternatives. They have to think about buying commodities, not only because it's a hedge against that situation, but because, you know, when you get that risk off, it will increasingly be commodities that rally. Skylar, what do you think the inflation conversation, with that in mind then, will look like when we get to the end of this year? It's difficult to say with the geopolitical tensions, I'm sure, but even aside from those... A lot of the direction of travel of late has been to think more about inflation and not less. Absolutely. I, I totally understand the worries over stickier inflation, right? On the good side, we have both shipping disruptions as well as the commodity bit. And then on the services side, you're seeing stickier wages. And so I understand that people are more worried about inflation. I think there's definitely a difference between the U.S. and Europe in terms of the consumer being very strong in the U.S. means that they're not pushing back against that possible commodity price increase feeding into prices on the headline. So you can have that margin expansion still there or just the margins, you know, not taking the full brunt of those commodity price increases. In Europe, consumers are pushing back more. And so margins will have to take that brunt. And so that's a little bit more concerning. But it means that you don't have as an inflationary effect if you get significantly higher commodity prices.
Skylar, thanks so much. Thanks for coming in this Friday. Skylar Montgomery Coning, Director of Macro Strategy at TS Lombard. European equity markets under pressure, down by six tenths of 1%. US futures still to, uh, pointing lower, even if they are off earlier lows. Uh, e minis down by half a percent. We'll come back with more on market reactions to developments in the Middle East. This is me. Welcome back to the programme. 8.23 here in uh, London this Friday morning. We have European equity markets moving lower this morning, down by six tenths of one percent on the stock 600. That is all geopolitics. Bucking the trend, L'Oreal in the consumer goods space up by five percent. So really bucking the trend this morning. Uh, it seems that this business bouncing back as Europe and North America offsets and weakness in China is uh, the overarching story. We saw it trade higher in the United States and lift some of its peers in the United States as these numbers came out. Let's get some analysis. Bring in Deborah Aitken from Bloomberg Intelligence, senior analyst for luxury goods and beauty. She's got a number of stories she can talk to us about this morning. So really interesting to get your perspective. Um, the the, the L'Oreal story then, it, um, t talk us through it. What's been going on here with goods and beauty then, Deborah? So um, I think into numbers, the, uh, the sector overall was quite muted low. Um, we'd seen a couple of numbers from the US with Ulta, one of the retailers over there of beauty, just not perhaps having enough new products and innovative type brands in the store and so it suffered a little bit and some of the industry data was very strong. So we ran a 4.5% growth at Q4 from L'Oreal. We saw the second half of 23 uh, a bit slower for the sector overall and for luxury goods too, so very strong one half slower, two half, and all of a sudden we run on 9% growth into uh, one queue. And that's after Beiersdorf, uh, which owns uh, Nivea in mass market, but also La Prairie at the high end, uh, ran 7% plus in its one queue. So it's kind of, well, actually, when we look at the numbers, Europe is double digit, North America is double digit, and high single digit if we pull out one early order into Canada on mm -hmm. IT. Um, and emerging markets are up 16%. And then across that, you have three out of four sectors outperforming. So we're still awaiting Lux repair, and we're still awaiting China, China repair. So North Asia is still slightly negative. Well, let's zoom in on that China piece of the equation, the softness there. Walk us through what that means. So uh, we've been waiting for China to gradually improve. Um, um, you know, we saw at one point uh, two and a half years ago half of the sales growth from the high end uh, in the marketplace, a real trend down. And part of that from the Chinese consumer was because they were at home and not traveling. It really is big business to the beauty and the luxury goods industries. Yeah. Um, and what we're seeing now, if we look at the latest numbers we have on the travel side um, for China, they're staying at home and they're traveling. So, for example, just to switch over, but we are talking about L'Oreal Luxury and the luxury industry. Um, if we think about 2019, we used to say the Chinese consumer globally accounted for a third of the luxury goods market. Yep. And right now it's 23%. And they used to spend about 10% of uh, 10 of that 33. In China, it's now 16%. So they're doing much more in China. But as a cohort, they're still not where they were. And that's the story. Just very briefly, I've got about 45 seconds here. Unilever to delay its recyclability, as a hard word to say, pledged mm -hmm. by as much as 10 years. How significant is this? What does this do to its ESG credentials? Yeah, and I think it's about... Um, it still scores very well on ESG, but it needs to really focus in terms of its profitability on its biggest yeah. um, categories and businesses, and that's been the promise from new CEO Heinz Schumacher. Um, and that's where we'll yep. see it moving forward for the sake of the P&L. Deborah, great to see you. Thank you very much indeed for stopping by to update us. Deborah Aitken joining us from Bloomberg Intelligence. Um, those stocks have really underperformed this year. Coming up, we'll get back to what is happening in the oil story. We'll update you on the reaction to the overnight news surrounding Iran. We'll do that next. This is Bloomberg. of geopolitical challenges that we saw when we looked really carefully at the data is that markets tend to initially overreact 
And I think it's precisely what we're alluding to here. That overreaction reflects that uncertainty premium when it first erupts. But typically, uh, these events end up being less disruptive than we fear they, they might be. City Nation Sheets joining us a little bit earlier on, talking us through the geopolitical implications of what we've learned overnight. Though what we've learned overnight keeps changing, uh, certainly as we worked our way through this morning, uh, in terms of the ferocity of the attack uh, that maybe the Israelis uh, delivered on Iran. We'll continue to keep you updated on that. Nathan was making some really interesting points about the idea that maybe actually as we go through the energy transition, oil becomes less of the transmission mechanism from geopolitics into the real economy. But that certainly is still the case right now, it is still the transmission mechanism. So Brent rallying as much as 4.2% uh, overnight. We've been through 90 bucks a barrel. Uh, this obviously following uh, the launch of this attack. Stephen Chep Stepchinsky, I'm going to get that right one day, joins us now to discuss all of this. Stephen, good morning. Big initial reaction. We didn't know much at that point. Kind of light overnight trading. Walk us through kind of where we are now, how the oil market is perceiving what we've seen overnight. Okay, I think the oil market went from high levels of anxiety in, in my morning, which is your night, uh, and now it, it seems much calmer as we have a better grasp of the situation. When oil prices were surging above $90, Brent, that was a situation where there was a bit of a fog of information. There were a lot of reports on Twitter and also from local media that were unverified that said that there were explosions in Iran and other places. It wasn't clear the situation the severity of the attack and who even did the attack. You know, it was we, the market had for a long time been uh, watching uh, for Israel's response to Iran's attack um, over the weekend. So the market was anxious and prices were surging quite high. But now as as more details come out, it does seem, according to uh, Iranian uh, spokespeople and, and their local media there, that um, there were uh, some drones that were shot down, but they are saying that there isn't major damage to any or any significant damage to any of their infrastructure. And it does seem like uh, Iran's government does appear to be downplaying the situation. Now, Bloomberg had confirmed with U.S. officials that Israel had um, prepared a strike. Uh, but again, while we do know what the situation is, well, we don't exactly know what the situation right now is, the market is significantly coming down. You know, we're almost, we're, we're at 88, or we're below 88 now, uh, dollars uh, for Brent uh, oil. Uh, so I, I think there is a bit of a calm. Uh, still, people are jumping. No matter what comes out, if there are more details that come out, it could, it could change that over the next few uh, hours. Stephen, talk to us about this kind of geopolitical premium that so many people are calling for here. It feels like now there's, for your, to your point, a lack of clarity on this kind of tit for tat between Israel and Iran. The focus is largely showing up on the Strait of Hormuz, uh, potential enforcement of sanctions as well. What is kind of the bull case for oil prices here? What is the high end of the range that you're hearing? Yeah, I mean, certainly if, if there is uh, a worst-case scenario for oil, that would be the closure of the Strait of Hormuz. Now, to be 100 percent clear, it, it isn't uh, likely that that's going to happen at this case. And also, um, we earlier on the show had FG chairman Fesheraki, he's an oil expert. He was also downplaying the, the idea that the Strait of Hormuz could even be shut uh, for very long. He said that if it happened, Iran would do it as more of a symbolic move. That would be days, maybe a week tops. Um, and, of course, that... Any closure there would affect Iran's economy just as much as it would affect the rest of the region. But if that does happen, we would see spikes in oil. Some analysts and traders suggest that if there is a closure, the market would react, perhaps even overreact, and you would see Brent above $100. Uh, if it's extended outage, if it does seem like that this starts to really start to halt trade because the Strait of Hormuz is for 30 percent of uh, oil trade and 20 percent of liquefied natural gas. You could see oil jumping quite significantly. But for natural gas, you could see gas LNG prices uh, rise almost tenfold from where we are today, according to Reistad Energy. And that would be an all time high. LNG would rise higher than where it was in 2022 in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which upended the gas market. So the Strait of Hormuz is key, but that is absolutely just a tail risk. It is not something that the market is pricing in at this moment.
Mm. And so we're working through a lot of questions around the geopolitics, Stephen, and exactly what happened. As you point out, Iran does seem to be downplaying uh, the relevance, and so therefore the market maybe gets a chance to focus later in the day at European time on other things. And where will that take us? Because midweek we saw a big drop in oil prices uh, as a result of maybe Chinese data, the U.S. stockpiles data. What's the demand story like right now, Stephen? You know, the demand story is also a bit hazy. I think um, if you had talked to me uh, at the end of last year, there was a general view in the market that demand was going to be quite weak. Um, and we are seeing some weak data points right now. But overall, uh, oil demand has been, I think, stronger than what some people have expected. I think there's also a lot of focus on, on supply. Of course, OPEC Plus has their supply cuts through the end of the second quarter. Um, and again, FG Chairman Fashiraki said that that, that is basically 6 million barrels uh, per day of oil that's just untapped that could quickly come in. So there isn't really a shortage of, of oil, but there is certainly a, a deficit because of what OPEC Plus is doing. As well, um, you could see that shale production has been uh, pretty resilient. So all those things could... Um, sort of offset each other, but we are in a bit of a deficit, and the fundamentals are backing up this kind of high $80 level. Uh, Goldman had a note earlier saying that $90 is probably uh, really the, the, the highest that will go before we start seeing uh, a, quite a resurgence in shale production, therefore bringing prices down more. So this $80 range is probably where we're going to play for a little while until OPEC Plus starts to add more barrels to the market, if they do decide to do so uh, after June. Stephen, how marginal are Iranian barrels. How important are they in terms of price setting? Um, so there, there, it's, it's a couple, a couple uh, million barrels a day, uh, about three million, four million barrels a day of, of, of oil. Now, that, again, is not um, a huge uh, uh, amount, uh, but it is something that if there were a stricter a regime from the United States, on, on Iranian oil, if there were stricter measures against Iran, then certainly uh, you would see a price reaction because barrels would leave the market. But again, quoting uh, FGE chairman Fashiraki, who, who knows this market very well, he said if all of uh, Iranian oil were to leave the market in one day, Saudi Arabia could meet that supply. So it wouldn't lead to any shortages. So again, that's something to remember. Even if there are a significant disruption in Iranian uh, exports, there is a supplier right next door, right nearby, that could fill that gap. But then there's the U.S. sanction story as well. When we're talking about the disruption, there's already U.S. sanctions placed on Iran, but the enforcement seems to be a question. A Eurasia Group, for example, saying that a loss of 500,000 barrels per day of shipments just off that extra enforcement could result in an increase of 2 to $3 a barrel. Is that consensus, Stephen? What, what does the sanctions impact have, especially when we get that voting, uh, that bill out of, the, out of Congress tomorrow? What does that impact have on the oil story? Well, first off, you know, just, just because Congress uh, votes on something doesn't mean it will become law the next day. Um, there is still a process. But that all being said, if there is stricter uh, rules against Iran, yes, there will be a market reaction. The market reacts to a, a lot of things. But in terms of an actual supply deficit, if, people, if, you're, if you're worried about people getting their oil, there might be a bit of a period where um, there is a tighter market and there is a more of a deficit. But... OPEC plus Saudi Arabia could decide to fill that gap. And that is something that is left to, to them in the decision making in Riyadh and with their allies. So there is a consensus that any more, uh, any stricter measures against Iran, if, if the U.S. were to have a uh, stricter, the, 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 they were actually enforcing the rules that are in place and it is harder for um, oil importers to get Iranian crude, then yes, there will be um, likely a price reaction. But it could be, according to the traders and some analysts, relatively short-lived if that gap, again, is filled by, by other uh, OPEC members. So I think it is to remember, reminded that while uh, there could be uh, oils that, oil barrels that leave the market, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're suddenly in a shortage that, that results in canceled shipments or people not being able to get the oil that they need. Bloomberg, Stephen Stepchinski, walking us through the various scenarios of what might happen with the oil price off the geopolitical developments overnight. We thank you so much. Coming up, we stick with the commodity space, depending on how you view it. Bitcoin pairing losses after falling on the geopolitical tension in the Middle East, now officially in the green. We're going to get the view from Kathleen Braitman, co-founder of the Tezos blockchain next, ahead 
of the highly anticipated having this is Bloomberg. The Olympics, Sporting World Cups, leap years and Bitcoin halving. They each happen every four years and in the crypto world, halvings typically meant a boon for prices. In a nutshell, Bitcoin halving means fewer new tokens are issued. That's because Bitcoin miners, who validate blockchain transactions, receive 50% less of a reward for doing so. At Bitcoin's launch in 2009, miners received 50 new coins per block. Post the halving in 2024, that'll be cut to just 3.125 Bitcoin instead. In the past, we've seen prices spike following the event. For example, in 2012, when the token jumped by 8,000% in the following 12 months. This time around, the prospect for further gains is unclear. Some analysts say the halving could trigger upside of at least 80%. Others argue the event is already baked in, particularly as Bitcoin's already risen to fresh records this year. Which brings to mind a familiar phrase, past performance does not guarantee future results. And it's been a bumpy ride over the last 24 hours. The Bitcoin halving is here. We've been anticipating it as we've just been hearing for quite some time. But we've had geopolitical tension overnight, which initially sent actually Bitcoin lower. It's now popped a little higher. It's interesting to see how gold and Bitcoin are reacting, maybe in different ways, being used as different things. JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank strategists, uh, saying that today's once every four year halving, as we've just been hearing, largely priced in. So we've already moved on from that and maybe are now pricing in actually some of the, the geopolitical tension. Kathleen uh, Brightman, co-founder of Tezos, Blo Tezos Blockchain, joins us now on set. Let's come back to the, the, the halving in just a moment. There's lots of interesting questions around that. But the action overnight speaks to maybe how people continue to perceive Bitcoin and it's not as digital gold, it's as a sort of technology asset more akin to how we maybe perceive the, the Nasdaq, i.e. when we go risk off, Bitcoin falls. W what does that tell us about the journey that Bitcoin has gone on and how far it's come to becoming that kind of store of value asset that maybe gold is or maybe it hasn't? I mean, it's still an extraordinarily risky asset. Um, yep. I think the goal is for it to become some sort of digital gold, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a ten-year-old uh, you know piece of software, <laughs> um, yep. and uh, still got a ways to go to prove itself uh, as one of those havens. Uh, we saw something very similar in the price of Bitcoin dropping at the beginning of COVID um, in like March 2020, when things I think hit people with reality. Uh, the first thing they tended to sell off was their pretend internet money. Um, so this is a pretty predictable reaction to something that I think has probably spooked a lot of people in the world. Pretend internet money. Yes. That's, that's, <laughs> I, that, a lot of people are going to be kind of quite annoyed by that statement. They're going to say that, that, <laughs> that this is something that this is something that actually has made the transition to becoming something more useful. You're not convinced. Oh, I think it's good to be self-effacing when you're dealing with an experimental technology. And yep. at the end of the day, Bitcoin is born out of a hobbyist exercise on a mailing list. So um, it's good to stay humble. <laughs> Okay. It's good to stay humble. Uh, we will get to the halving because I know that's also part of why we why why we're here to talk about to talk to talk to you about that. But given where you've taken us on this conversation, I wonder what that means then. In certain emerging markets, we've seen really high adoption rates mm -hmm. of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And what you've just said, you know, underscores the risks that some people are taking. I, I understand the reasons. If you're not convinced that your fiat currency or legal tender is being managed well, then this might, uh, relatively speaking, seem like an attractive option. But it's still sum up the risks for us? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin solves a problem that has vexed people for many centuries, which is how do you exchange value with someone without the use of or risk of an intermediary? Um, I think that it solves a really important problem, especially on the internet today. And for some people, it's really a lifeblood or a really viable alternative to what they would currently be using in the absence of its existence. Um, but it's certainly not a panacea. Mm. I, I, I if people are adopting it as, their, as, a, as a store of value in certain places where they don't trust their own currency anymore, I mean, you know, theoretically at least, in certain democratic situations, there are ways of getting rid of, getting, you know, politically get, uh, removing people who you don't like the way they manage assets. Yeah. But with this, you know, there's a lot of trust being placed in uh, a, a, an untested group of people, and we've seen some of them tested recently and ended up in court. A, a lot of faith being put perhaps in crypto bros. You know, what, what risks are people taking on that front? Well, 
um, cryptocurrencies, specifically Bitcoin, are designed to be censorship resistant, meaning that they can't be shut down by one person or entity or group. Um, in some ways, this is a massive virtue um, in the sense that, you know, if you can't trust the centralized yes. entity... if you want it to be outside your democratic system, then that's great. But if you want it to be inside your democratic system... Or if your system isn't democratic. Yes. Um, but, uh, which oftentimes is not. Many people in the world live under authoritarian regimes. Um, and for them, I think Bitcoin offers an interesting alternative uh, to exchange value with people. Mm. When we're talking about kind of we're, a lot about the macro, we talked about the EM as well. There's a question right now of dollar strength and rise in energy prices. Those are both going to factor into not just Bitcoin, but, of course, the other blockchains that, that come off about Ethereum is the immediate one that comes to mind, plus the energy costs involved in actual mining. How are you thinking about a little bit more of the macro there? Yeah, well, blissfully, um, Bitcoin is a little bit uh, uncommon amongst cryptocurrencies in that most of the industry has moved on to proof of stake. Um, which is more energy efficient. Um, it's really Bitcoin that's left with the big bugabear of um, how do you factor in energy prices, so on and so forth. Um, where it's interesting and intersects with miners in some provocative ways is that a lot of the um, people who are securing the network have their bills denominated in a separate currency than Bitcoin. Um, so that interplay has been interesting to watch over the last few years. But um, Bitcoin is a really remarkably well-designed system in the sense that uh, it's gone through a lot of volatility, but it still seems to work as intended. Um, so credit where it's due, that's pretty hard to do uh, 12 years out of anything. So then talk to us about the ripple effects here. If Bitcoin is kind of the most perhaps well-known, at least in, in traditional finance communities when it comes to uh, the cryptocurrency that we're watching most closely, what is the ripple effect then in, in Ethereum and in, in your own blockchain that, that you look at Walk us through the ripple effects and the nuances of the market. Yeah, I mean, the market tends to, like, move on momentum, right? It's a, it's a very mimetic market, so you have to know the memes. And uh, there are certain memes that uh, make a lot of sense, and there are certain memes that don't make a lot of sense. Uh, I think, you know, the happening is going to increase the price is one of the sillier um, memes, but it's only happened three times, so it's also not a very big sample set. Are we, how far away are we from the point where it makes no sense for miners to, to keep mining? because they're not getting the return that they want. Electricity prices, you've already alluded to, in some ways Bitcoin is sort of digital electricity. What we through the process over the, over the next four, eight, 12 years of how this process is going to unfold? Yeah, so one of the sillier memes, um, I think, is that B the Bitcoin grid is like a battery, like you can't actually take energy out of it. So I think that's kind of a silly one. Um, but I think uh, to your point, uh, like when will miners stop mining? Um, I mean, geez, uh, the price has been super volatile for all of its existence and yeah. people have continued to mine on it. Um, one has to believe that there's, you know, rational economic actors on, on that side doing the math correctly. Uh, OK, so, so they're, they're doing the math correctly. Ha Plug in the electricity story for me. Where does the volatility come from going forward? Is it with electricity prices? How does, how does, how does the, the bills, you talk about the fact that their bills are denominated in different currencies. I'm, I'm wondering kind of what is the genesis of the, electricity, of, of the volatility story for Bitcoin going forward from here? Is it geopolitics? Is it energy prices? Is it kind of what, what am I looking for in terms of the clues and the usefulness as a signaling tool that Bitcoin is going gonna, is gonna to generate? Yeah, I don't know if I have a great answer for that in the sense that um, it's been a very, it's been a really wacky market to follow. Um, it has a very humble origin story. It's kind of remarkable that there's an ETF market for it now. Um, if you think about it, it's like a very precocious teenager. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the future holds, but I do think like the way the system is designed is elegant enough and um, easy to reason about enough that like certainly it's, it's attracted a lot of money and capital to it. So, so you sort of, there's a lot of humility required then in terms of the sector and what it's achieved. But, but a lot of people are pretty excited about what the AI um, world might present. Some people suggesting that the blockchain can be used to sort of verify well contracts, for example, but also in a, in a world of fake this and fake that to, to be used as a verification tool. Do you have high expectations, Kathleen, on that front? Um, I would say in general, any person who's telling you that AI plus blockchain equals like great idea is probably overstating something or trying to sell you a token that has very specious claims. Um, and so I'm uniformly quite skeptical. I mean, blockchain, sure, they can... Um, they can <clears throat> obviously verify things and add, uh, add some sort of time stamping, but uh, that's originally what they're supposed to do. But, you know, Haber and Stardetta also solved that in the 1960s. And so that's a pretty dated technology. It's not something that a blockchain uniquely offers you.
Okay, Kathleen, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Kathleen uh, Brightman, co-founder of the Tezos blockchain. Uh, so uh, lots of, to talk about this morning. Uh, we've gone from, let's go from, from uh, crypto, which is part of the geopolitics this morning, yep. because we saw an initial reaction that told us quite a lot to your first question to Kathleen about the way that investors approach this asset right now. Yeah, it, it is a speculative asset. Is a risk. Not it digital is, gold just yet. It, it is not digital gold just yet. Gold has been reacting like gold you would expect it to yeah. react. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's interesting. But, but crypto hasn't. The correlations are maybe stronger, therefore, with what we've seen in technology. And technology stocks have taken a, a significant hit over the last few days. And Bitcoin feels like it has a better relationship with that sector rather, mm. than, rather than maybe in, in, into the commodity space. She was talking about volatility. We've certainly seen a lot of volatility this week. You've only got to look at what's happening with the VIX spike that we've had, and it's a similar story over here in Europe. VIX is up really sharply. We've gone from kind of 12s to 20s really fast. And a lot of people remember short of this, so there's a squeeze factor into this market as well. But kind of where do you fade this? Does it continue to go higher? If VIX continues to go higher, is this something that, that you want to be taking a clear signal from, i.e., you're going to get some pretty big price swings here, at maybe the amplitude of those price swings we haven't fully seen yet in terms of how big they could get. Yeah, and for a long time we were asking, you know, where, where is, the, is the VIX low? Why is it as low as it is? Um, but not just in equity markets. We were asking, you know, why is the bond market? We were seeing volatility there. Why is that acting as the sort of shock absorber for volatility? And yet in FX markets we weren't seeing that volatility. Maybe something's changing then, Kriti. Yeah, the, the divergences that we traditionally see, uh, or have seen, I should say, between the bond market and the FX market kind of closing a little bit. And we talked about this yesterday as well. When we, in the last two days, I would say, when we started to see that weakness show up uh, in, in the euro, in, in cable, this dollar positioning is finally snapping because it feels like there's this narrative, there's clarity from the Federal Reserve. Whether or not that's true, the fact that they're starting to get these implications where the market is saying higher for longer, inflation re-upping is a real risk, you're now hearing that in the narrative. And I think we, we keep, I keep using this, this phrase, whether it's the, the dog wagging its tail or the tail wagging its dog, it feels like you can apply that to so many different circumstances here. And right now it feels like it is the markets that are then getting kind of almost validated by what you're hearing by from the Fed speak. European stocks down by seven cents of one percent right now then, stock 600 down. Geopolitics clearly is the, is the thing that's driving things. U.S. futures are weaker despite the fact we've seen quite a lot of uh, Iranian downplaying of yep. what's been going on here. I suppose as we head into the rest of Friday and into next week, we continue to ask questions about whether the earnings stories uh, offset concerns around Absolutely. interest rate trajectory and geopolitics at this point. The earnings season, in theory, should be the dominant force over the next few days. In theory, we're going to get, uh, and next week it gets super busy. The list is so long next Precisely. week. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> Tune in, folks. Believe you me, we're going to have a busy, bumpy week next week as we try and digest all the, uh, the news that we're getting from some of these corporates. But if, if it doesn't live up to expectations, then the market feels like it's in a very rocky place. Certainly yeah. risk assets feel like they're in a very rocky place. You've got a Fed that is now pushing back on the idea of cuts. You've got geopolitical tension that is moving in the opposite direction. You've got earnings that aren't necessarily going to deliver. The equity market has had a great run, a great run at the start of this year. Mm. Are people going to be getting to the point where they're saying, you know what, it's time to take some chips off the table? Do I need to profit take at this point? You've already seen some evidence of that this week. Yeah. If that starts to pick up momentum... How far could it take Will us? Will the AI and the growth stories be enough this time around to offset yeah. people's fears about not getting the interest rates that they were not promised at all, but assuming yeah. at the start of the year? And this is where the geopolitics actually come into the bottom line. Because I remember last earnings season, we had these CEOs come on and say, are the Red Sea tensions showing up? And they said, not yet, but it could in a couple of months. We're a couple of months later. Is this now where you see some sort of material impact? We'll be covering that angle as well. I've got lots of things to do this weekend. I think we should just point out Critty's birthday this weekend. <laughs> Happy birthday in thank advance. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll not be having a crisis about aging. That's fine. We'll no, postpone that's, that to Monday. Uh, not on air, anyway. Not on air. <laughs> I'll be watching the vote. We do that in private. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. That is it for Markets Today. The Pulse is up next. They'll continue to take you through the weakness in markets driven by the geopolitics. This is Bloomberg.